been some time since we've done one of these, but welcome back to art school. If you're new here, in this series I try to break down the important elements of various Pokemon art styles and, more importantly, the techniques for how you can achieve the same results. And, as a demonstration, I'm also developing a family of Fanmon. We started with a Generation 1 style sprite of our base Fanmon, Water, and also developed it into the classic Sugimori watercolor style. Then added a Generation 2 style Babymon, Snotter, and last time we introduced a Generation 4 style evolution, Slaughter. Water and Snotter were developed primarily in pixel art, but now we've switched modes, following the usual process for Generation 3 and onward, where the Pokémon were designed before their sprites were made. So today I'm going to make a Generation 5 style sprite of Slaughter, including all of the preparations for it to be animated, although in the interest of time I'm not going to actually animate it. The style of Pokémon sprites in the Advance and DS generations is similar enough that some Pokémon have sprites that are reused unchanged or almost unchanged across multiple generations. And for others, even if the sprite itself was changed, they don't show significant stylistic differences from one generation to the next. But there are some important differences that we're going to talk about, starting with the size of the canvas, the amount of space available for the sprite. Whereas generations 1 and 2 used 56 pixel squares, generation 3 was 64, generation 4 was 80, and generation 5 was 96 pixels. And this makes a big difference. The later generations have a lot more room for detail. Although it's important to note that most Pokémon don't use all of the available space, so this really helps to highlight the different sizes of the Pokémon. For example, here's an 8-inch tall Natu compared to 8-foot tall Lapras. The size difference in Generation 5 is still not realistic, but it sure looks more convincing than in Generation 2. Then there's animation. Ruby and Sapphire and Fire Red and Leaf Green used static sprites, so if you don't feel like animating, go for one of those styles. Emerald and every game in Generation 4 plays a one-time animation when the Pokémon enters the battle. The sprites have only two frames, but they can also be rotated and moved and distorted to create additional movement. The frame that the animation starts with doesn't have to be the same one that it ends with. For Generation 5, there is a big change. The sprites are now animated on a loop throughout the entire battle. And the way they accomplish this is pretty clever. They break out the sprites into various parts that can be animated individually, using either multiple frames or transformations and distortions or a bit of both. The size and the animation style of the sprites also directly affects another element the pose of the Pokémon. The effect of size is pretty obvious, like when you have only 64 pixels, you can't really fit a stretched out Steelix in that, so you have to work within it. But you may not realize how the animation affects this as well. When you have no animation, or if you have a one-time animation, the sprite spends most of the battle unmoving, so you can give it pretty much any pose you want. You can give it a really active pose, like it's in the middle of doing a move or something, and that doesn't really stand out too much. Our imaginations and our suspension of disbelief can take care of that. But when you have what is essentially an idle animation loop and you have more dynamic camera movements around the battlefield, you end up having to use poses that are much more neutral. Because you have to be able to move the parts around, and you have to make sure that it looks convincing as a pose that the Pokémon can actually hold. Another sort of technical consideration is the number of colors that you can use per sprite. In Generation 3, I think there was an actual limitation on the file size of the sprites, which kept us to 16 colors, including black, white, and the transparency, so that leaves 13 colors maximum for you to work with. In Generations 4 and 5, I'm pretty sure the technical limitation didn't exist anymore, but the sprites do generally still stick to that maximum as a stylistic choice. That said, there is a pretty notable difference in the use of colors. Have a look at these sprites of Charizard from Ruby and from Diamond. Keep in mind that Generation 5 uses the same base sprite as Diamond. In Ruby, Charizard has three shades of blue on the wing, three shades of orange on the body, three shades on the belly, two shades just on the tongue, four colors for the fire, plus one shade of grey used in the claws and the teeth, and one shade of brown in the outlines. And yes, some of those colors are actually reused, but it's relatively few. 
It's almost like after being so constrained in how many colors they could use for the first two generations, Game Freak wanted to make sure they used as many colors as they could. But in Diamond, it's a lot simpler. We still have three shades on the main body, but the wings and the belly only have two each, the fire only has three, and the tongue only has one. There is also an extra shade of gray, but we still have some repeat shades too. How those colors get used is also pretty different, in particular the highlights, which you can see in the ruby sprite are used pretty extensively on the arms, the legs, tail, head, wings, and belly. Whereas in the diamond sprite, there's only a tiny bit of highlight used on the head and the wings. The ruby sprite also has a significant amount of dithering, the checkerboard pattern of two shades that helps smooth the transition between them. While in diamond, there is dithering, but a lot less. Overall, the shading is a lot harsher. I should point out that none of these stylistic elements, the number of colors, the use of highlights and dithering, none of that is universal. They don't apply to every sprite. Some generation three sprites use only a couple of shades per color. Some generation four sprites use dithering more prominently. Some generation five sprites use plenty of highlights. These are just trends that can help you get your sprite looking more like it belongs in whichever game you want. One other trend that I noticed in a few sprites, so it's not a very strong trend, is that the later games seem to have more differences in the hue of different shades of the same color. Hue's that Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> the hue, in case you're not familiar with the term, basically describes where on the color wheel a color is, so it's expressed in degrees. If we look at these Charizard sprites again, the main body color and the shadow color on the ruby sprite have very nearly the same hue. Most of the contrast between the shades comes from the brightness and the saturation. Whereas on the diamond sprite, there's a much more significant difference in the hue. The shadow is much redder. But to be fair, the wing shades on ruby use hues that are more different than the ones on diamond. So this is really not universal, but from what I've noticed, it seems to be used a little bit more overall in the later games. In any case, hue shifting tends to look better, so I suggest you use it anyway. A good rule of thumb is that shadows should look cooler, so you shift them towards blue, and highlights should look warmer, so you shift them towards yellow, no matter what the base color is. All right, I think I can get to work on making my own sprite now. Most of the techniques I'm going to use here we already talked about in previous episodes of Art School, so I'm not going to explain things too in depth. I recommend that right from the get-go you draw each piece of your sprite on its own layer. This will make it easier to adjust proportions, but it will also help later on when we're preparing the sprite for animation. Since I'm going for the Gen 5 approach, I'm using shadows extensively, but adding only a few spots of highlight. We also color the outlines like we did in previous episodes, but this time it's much subtler. Most of the outline stays black. We only color the areas that are closer to the light source, so mostly the top of the head. And we're not going to use very light colors on the outline. In Generation 3, you might see more colorful outlines with more of the outline being colored and in brighter colors, but not so much in Generations 4 and 5. Generally, we're using a shade that's darker than the shadow. The shadow color itself can also be used on the outline, but only sparingly, only in the brightest areas, or sometimes to indicate a fold or to create texture, but that's not the case here. Also keep an eye out for how you can reuse colors. Like I used the shadow color from the brown parts as also the darker outline color for the yellow parts. Okay, I'm happy enough with how this looks, so it's time to prepare it for animation. You have to consider how you would want the sprite to move. Each piece would be anchored to the sprite, sort of like a skeleton rig for 3D animation, and each part can be moved, rotated, or distorted. I'm picturing this Pokemon raising one arm and swiping with the other, and maybe also swishing its tail. So I need to make sure to extend those pieces a bit, so that gaps don't show up between, say, the base of the tail and the main body when we start moving the tail around. I'm also going to break some of the pieces I had on a single layer. The tail is now two pieces to give us more flexibility in animating it, the chest is separate from the base of the trunk so it can have a breathing cycle raising the chest a bit, and the ears are separate from the head so that it can flick them. 
Each part can also have multiple frames of animation. Sometimes just rotating and such isn't enough or the angle doesn't quite work, so you can create animation frames, much like we did for Snotter in the Generation 2 sprite, but for just one part at a time. I'm creating frames so that Slaughter can blink and open its mouth, as well as properly raise its arm and swipe with the other claw. Just to finish up, I'm making some adjustments to the colors to better match the colors that I had last time, and yes, it is a bad idea to change colors this late in the game, thank you for asking. Hopefully I didn't miss changing any of the pieces. I also decided to add just a little bit of dithering here and there. So here is the final sprite in its base pose, and here it is disassembled into all of the pieces and animation frames that I made. I could have actually animated this sprite, but I chose not to, mostly because the program that I would have known how to use best for this kind of animation, Adobe After Effects, I haven't used it pretty much at all in like 10 years, not since I was in university. So I think the learning curve for me to relearn how to use it and get the results that I'm looking for, if it even would be an appropriate software to use for this, I think it's just not worth it. You can probably get almost as much benefit just by looking at an official sprite. But I hope that this was helpful to you. And if you make any Pokemon or Fanmon sprites using what you learned today, I would love to see it. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. Next time, we'll give another look at the quote unquote Sugimori art, and hopefully it won't take me five months to do it. Thank you to my patrons for supporting this channel morally and financially, especially luxury patron Ethan from Chicago. And thank you all for watching. I'll see you in the next chapter.